cock. Is that the, is that the femur we're looking at? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I think we're starting to... Every blow of the pick loosens a cloud of chalk dust. So working carefully and patiently with brush and all, I uncover enough of the bone so that I can tell what I have found. Those are the words of Charles H. Sternberg, a dinosaur hunter who worked under both Marsh and Cope. Sternberg's description is a century old, but the process of digging for dinosaurs has changed so little that it still fits. This material, which is very familiar to most of us, is actually about as high-tech as we attain. It's called all-purpose paleontological paper. You see, it's two-ply. Well, it's supposed to be two-ply. Come on, open up there. Unscented, white, and we use it to protect fossils against attrition when they're wrapped up to be shipped. It doesn't matter if you break them. What matters is if you grind them. And to keep them from being ground, we simply wrap them in paper. At this level, it's what works that counts. And this really works. After they have been traced, a ditch is cut around them, and by repeated blows of the pick, the slab which contains them is loosened. This is then securely wrapped and strengthened with plaster. kind of get a feel. Man, that's a lot of guesswork as to how far that specimen actually goes down. And once you think you know how far, then like right here, we decided that the bone comes down probably six to eight inches. And there's no point in carrying all this extra dirt and weight, so we're gonna cut all that away. Once this once we, got, we got surprised last year with a couple of them because their tails just went straight down. We started running into them as we were digging under them. See? You kind of have to gauge yourself with the specimen. Old ideas, like the one that dinosaurs abandoned their young at birth, crumble in the face okay, of new discoveries. Could dinosaurs yeah, have been good parents? Whatever the case, you do have to explain why there are little ones here together and what reason it was that these animals came to this site for so many, presumably thousands of years, and kept coming back. At least, it tells you in this case that small ones stayed around together. May, maybe because they were staying in a nesting area, and maybe because the parents were protecting them here in this area. They shouldn't have that power. Do it. Count of three. Okay. One, two, three. Four. Okay. Oh. Beautiful. Banzai. There it is. Perfect. Perfect. No dinosaurs in the bottom. <laughs> After the days of digging and plastering, there's time to assess the importance of what's been found. There were plant-eating dinosaurs that reached maybe. 10 or 12 feet in maximum length and stood four or five, maybe six feet high. Uh, unlike many, most of the other dinosaurs that we would find in a typical site that's down near the coast, which are, would be dominated by carnivorous types and uh, much larger sauropod, brontosaurus, that sort of thing. Uh, this has to fit into the whole uh, paleontological and geological picture of that time. In that sequence of rocks, in other places here in central Texas, we have lots of other fossils of different kinds. And, and uh, that's one of the things that makes this so amazing, because there's nothing else that's like it. Where were the big dinosaurs? We know the yeah, big there dinosaurs were, there were, there were big around dinosaurs. here at this time. Where, where was anybody? Where was everybody? Yeah, where, were the, yeah. where were the turtles? Yeah. Where were the crocodiles? Yeah. Yeah. Where were the clams? Where were the fish? So many young are in this uh, occurrence that we have to think in terms of what was the relationship between the parents and the young. 
uh, it does seem as though there was dinosaurs, or at least some dinosaurs, exhibited a great deal of parental care. And uh, <clears throat> what have we got? Well, the thing that comes to my mind is a rookery. Now, uh, Will has said, uh, without eggs, you haven't got a rookery. And that's quite true. But <clears throat> we may, may be dealing with a rookery in a time frame after the eggs have all been hatched or destroyed and the uh, young are still hanging around with their parents. It, you know, it, it's hellish hard for us as human beings to say what a dinosaur was like. Uh -huh. we, we can, if we, had a, if we were digging up fossil horses here, we could tell you with a great deal of detail what, uh, what they were like, because everybody has got a mental picture of what a horse is. Nobody has ever seen a dinosaur. Nobody's ever been as intimately associated with dinosaurs as we are with horses and cats and dogs and stuff like that there. Dinosaur bones that start at sites like the one at Proctor Lake. Go here. What I'm doing is just removing the rock off of the uh, skeletons of these little dinosaurs so we can expose them and eventually get them out of the rock. It's just uh, pure mechanical operation using a little pin is what we do all the fine work with. The block is from a place called Ghost Ranch in northern New Mexico. Inside the block there should be anywhere from 15 to 20 or 30 small dinosaurs and Hopefully something else besides Coelophysis, the little dinosaur, which is by far the most common animal from Ghost Ranch. You can see the skeletons come up to about this point here. When we prepare out this block, in other words, remove the rock over top of the bones, these skeletons should continue over the whole rock, and there should be about a dozen or two at least. And right here you can see the skull of a large individual animal. This is an animal that probably weighed about 50 pounds, which is pretty big for Coelophysis. And this is a reconstruction of what the little guy looked like. Very bird-like animal. Even though if you were really, if all you want to do to make this thing into a bird is put wings on it instead of the arms and eliminate the tail, and the rest of his anatomy is very much like a bird, except for a mouthful of teeth. Alex Down's laboratory has been designed to give museum visitors a window onto the process of uncovering dinosaurs. But behind the scenes, Smithsonian's paleontologists know a different kind of bone quarry than the one at Ghost Ranch. Like marshes, finding it requires not merely directions, Beginning but a native guide. Like the one at Proctor Lake, there is the feeling that what you are seeing has lain unseen and undisturbed through eons and epochs. The beginning of the sauropod collection. We have some oversized sauropods. Here we have the brontosaurus claw. This paleontological treasure trove lies not in Texas or Montana, but in the Smithsonian itself, in uncharted territory which the Smithsonian's Michael Brett Sermon knows like the back of his hand. This is the type room of the vertebrate paleontology division. A type specimen is the actual specimen used to name a new species. And in this room, we have over 1,800 type specimens, one of which is this specimen here, which is the upper right arm bone of Stegosaurus sulcatus. This is the armor of Edmontonia rugosidens. Generally, armor comes in three different types spikes, clubs, and plates. These are the first series of neck plates, which would sit right about here and would act as a, a physical deterrent. This is one of the shoulder spikes, which would first act as a visual deterrent and then as a physical deterrent.
This is the original restoration of Stegosaurus ungulatus done for Professor Marsh over 100 years ago. The importance of artwork like this shows how we conceive the appearance of Stegosaurus over time. It shows what bones were available at the time of the restoration, what scientists thought the animal looked like, and it also shows the relative position and sizes of the bones for scientists who can't come look at the original material. This particular restoration shows the plates in a single row. Around 1914, another theory came along saying that the plates were in a sort of a staggered alternating row. And recently, in the 1980s, the original single row theory has been resurrected again based upon new evidence. This is the skull of Ceratosaurus nasicornis marsh, and for the past 100 years, all restorations have been based upon this one skull. This is the famous nasal horn, and this is the only known meat-eating dinosaur that has a nasal horn like this. See, the teeth are serrated on the front and the back, so it's essentially a set of double steak knives in the mouth. This is our type skull of Triceratops obtusus, which shows several interesting features. The tooth row here consists of a single set of teeth that has enamel on the inside and dentine on the outside. The enamel, being harder than the dentine, wears away at a slower rate, so this is a self-sharpening tooth. The tooth battery is oriented vertically, so the teeth don't come together as our teeth do, but they come together in a shearing plane. Triceratops is essentially the first Cuisinart. This is a brain cast of Triceratops. We've taken a skull of Triceratops and sectioned it right down the middle and peeled the halves apart so we can see the inner structure of the brain. The front is toward this area. This section of the brain is for the sense of smell. This is for hormone regulation, this is for muscle coordination, and this is for breathing and heart rate and thinking occurred right in this area in here. It was once thought that a brain this small in an animal as large as Triceratops uh, made these essentially very stupid animals because they were so limited in brain size. We can compare it to a similar cast of Tyrannosaurus rex. And as we could see, Tyrannosaurus has a little bit larger brain, but that's because it's a carnivore, and all carnivores have larger brains than herbivores. These are the two hands from a duck-billed dinosaur. This specimen over here is the left side where the bones are normal. This is how they normally look. On the right side, this animal has had his hand broken and the bones have become shattered and because they weren't reset, there's been wild, uncontrolled bone growth all throughout the sides of the bone here. And because the nearest doctor is 70 million years away, this is what happens when you sustain an injury in the Mesozoic. In this cabinet, we have one of the back plates of Stegosaurus, which occurred over the legs. This is a section of the 11-foot-long Camarasaurus neck. This is the first specimen ever found of Triceratops. And this is the tail spike of Stegosaurus. Imagine four of these waving at you. Turning rocks into bones and bones into exhibits requires a kind of alchemy, the kind practiced in the Smithsonian's Paleo Preparatory Lab, presided over by Arnie Lewis. You don't come by fossils easily. That's the whole thing. They come in bits and pieces. A paleontologist may get three good specimens in his lifetime. I've been extremely lucky that I've been in three or four localities that had never been prospected before and so I've seen some really good fossils. Like Santa's elves at the North Pole, paleo prep technicians prepare fossilized bones for exhibit and research. Paleo prep artists create spare parts to fill in for what explorers have yet to find. And skilled, dedicated volunteers chip in for the fun of it.
And you won't find a better guide than Arnie Lewis to the place where it all winds up, the Smithsonian Institution's Dinosaur Hall. The process in getting a major mount for, for the dinosaur.